Hello and welcome to Office Hours. If this is the first time that you've come across us, you can go and find out more about us at officehours.global. We spend two hours a day talking about all sorts of things about media production. And our first hour is always general discussion about those sorts of topics, all sorts of um, online and digital topics. Our second hour is always something that we want to focus in on. And today we're talking about live acoustics, live acoustics in historical spaces. We have a special guest, Michael Holmes, who specializes in recreating historical performances of music in churches, chapels, and, and chambers of European courts of the Renaissance and early Baroque era. Talk about a, a, a niche market that he's in. Uh, so he's going to be joining us later in the second hour. If you've got questions specifically about that, you can put them in Makana if you're, if you're there already. Or if you're not and you just want to ask a question, you can go to askofficehours.global and you can put your questions in there, both for our first hour and our second hour. Um, without any further ado, Bill, what about our first, what's our first question? Our first question comes from panelist Jeffrey Powers this morning from Madison, Wisconsin. As I'm clearing out for the move, I have an ATEM Production Studio 4K that is in perfect condition. Do you think it still has value to sell or should I donate it? Alex? Yes. <laughs> so, so, so I think that, you, you know, it, it, I'm sure it has some value. I mean, it depends on, on how, how much money you're trying to, to raise. Uh, you can probably get a couple hundred dollars for it. I don't, I, you know, generally I look at eBay to make decisions about that, those kinds of things as to whether it's there. Um, and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people who would, um, there's churches and nonprofits and all kinds of other things that would definitely value uh, a, um, a, a, a nice switcher. So, so I think that the, so my answer is yes. Jeffrey? So even, and, and one of the reasons why I did go on eBay and I looked at it, and of course you have the prices that people are posting, and then of course the, the prices that people actually buy the item with. Uh, so, and, and the, what I was thinking was you got a production house possibly that uses uh, the ATEM in their rack configuration. They don't, they're, it, it doesn't make sense for them to go like an ATEM mini or anything like that. Uh, so that's that's where I was going with this, and of course, with the ATEM, it's still 4K and it's got HDMI and SDI inputs to it. That's so. If it becomes something that uh, that just a like a, stu a studio would need to have uh, for use, I don't know. Fair enough, Chris. I believe, and I'm not certain that there was a certain stage in Black Magic history, Alder, where the switchers were only, or some switchers could not do progressive. They only did interlace. Is that true? Uh, yeah, it is true. The, 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 but the ATEM, I don't think the ATEM's ever been that way. Okay. That only did interlace? I, I, I don't know. Definitely not the 4Ks. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah so no, this 4K doesn't do... Point, yeah, this isn't the case. But the one thing that the production for or, or any of the, these items uh, have is that you can't really cross cameras too much on it. Can't cross. Uh, you have to frame match rates. the frame rate. You got to match everything. Yeah. Yeah. So with with before they put the Terranexes into every input, they they um you would need to make sure that your resolution and frame rate are identical for all the cameras, or it won't make the frame conversion. You had to do engineering, is what you're saying. Yeah, and you, you, you're exactly right, Chris, because I had a uh, an ATEM, uh, the 2ME, uh, one of the early ones, that, that flat one the fan. that, that used to get fan. super hot, and those ones wouldn't do progressive, so it would, it, would, it would only do interlaced, and so you could do 50, I could do 50i, but I couldn't do 25p, I couldn't do 30p. Right. Um, yeah, I so it wouldn't do 3G. That. I only say that because if it, if somebody is in the market for an, uh, a used switcher, that is, uh, and, and I don't know how old these were, but that is definitely a, a concern. You know, I know of a certain church in my hometown that uh, when the pandemic hit, I was looking at their streams that they were doing. I was like, wow, that looks awful. Why is that interlaced? And I, I actually contacted the guy and he goes, yeah, our switcher only does interlace. I was like, oh. It's, it was 720p or 1080i. 
is is was the was there it was you know and that was the very first generation of them and it was the ones with the i still have one in the in the garage um with the fins i should put i should put it the the back here because it's in my wall of depreciation um but it 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 had the uh uh it had the fins on the back of it and it was but yeah 1080i and 720p i'll get it out hot that's right all right next question Next one comes to us from Guy Cochran in Seattle, Washington. Is the CES 2024 show worth attending? And is today the last day to register without having to pay actual money for it? Uh, Jeff? Jeffrey? Yeah. Oh, I thought Bill was before me. Uh, So for me, it is perfect because, you know, uh, that's that's what my, that's what it revolves around. So out of all the conferences that are out there, CES is one that I have. I pretty much have to go to because it's all about the new tech on there. Uh, as for the day, last day to register uh, for free, uh, uh, technically yes, but yeah, usually if the attendance is low, a lot of these companies get free tickets to give out, and then they, you know, you'll see like little uh, web pages for whatever company it is, and they say if you want to sign up for a ticket, just come here, and then they get their name and email for. Uh, for their lists, but as press, I always get a free ticket, and uh, you can. It's it gets tougher when it gets closer to the event, but there's always ways to get a free ticket off of that. Bill, what's your take? You've been to CES many times. Yeah, I well, actually, I've only been to CES probably two or three times, and it was 25 years ago because the show confused me, and it confused me in this way. It's all about all consumer electronics, so you will be walking down the aisles. I had a client very early in my career who uh, ran stereo stores, and we would go to see all the new stereo gear because that was part of the CES thing. But here you are walking down aisles of refrigerators and trash compactors and just every type of consumer electronics that could possibly fit in there. So for me, it was always more difficult the the oh look at the cool new appliance for your kitchen or look at the cool new way they're using electronics in security systems those can be interesting but it was never a particularly focused show for me uh, yeah you can we were talking we had a little discussion before the show about just the cost of travel and the rest of that so if you think there's enough of what you are particularly interested in at ces it is one of the bigger shows in vegas and it will fill up a lot of the convention center and there will be lots of things to see whether there's enough of what you want to see versus the rest of the consumer electronics world that's a call you have to make for yourself yeah, and it feels like more of these shows now are competing with what we can find out online and you can have quite a good experience sitting at home. Uh, it's it's very different to what it was 25 years ago, right? <laughs> when you were, totally, you were like totally. The in- internet was just thinking about itself, trying to get uh, some more content. So it's much easier. To, I think now you can have people that are showing all these new products and new announcements and you're hearing announcements from the from directly from the companies. So it's a different thing, but... Anyway, we'll see what happens. Next question. Carlos Rojas in Washington, D.C. says, What can the panel recommend as a good microphone to capture subtle natural sound on an iOS or Android phone? Um, Bill. So I was just out doing this a couple of weeks ago. I have uh, a new book that I'm narrating, and it had it, it, it screamed to me that it needed natural sounds. It's a little sci-fi novel, and, and at one point, they get out of the virtual world and come into the real world. So the author specified the sound of crickets and running water and things like that to kind of build a soundscape for this. So I pulled out the mic that I'm speaking into now, which is my Sennheiser 416. I grabbed my little H4N recorder. And I went back out to do some sound effects things. I live next to a golf course, and there's a little creek through the middle of it. So I needed running water, and I needed wind in the trees, and just kind of standard natural sound effects. And it reminded me that I should have been doing more of that if I wanted to try to do it professionally. I got good results, but here's what I learned. A very low self-noise microphone is incredibly important because you're going to be gaining up a lot to get the subtle sounds of nature. Uh, Number two, the location you go to shoot in is incredibly important, and it's increasingly difficult in our mechanized world. I had to go out at 3 o'clock in the morning to get traffic sounds suppressed because that same microphone that was doing well with crickets and wind was also doing really well with the traffic 
18 blocks away. So it's really a kind of a specific, subtle, natural sound. You need a good set of headphones. You need a good preamp system, a good recorder. And you also need very good technique because I can't tell you the number of takes I ruined because my hands on the suspension system were just not, I wasn't used to holding it completely still for a five minute take. Next time I go out, I think I'm going to take a small stand so I don't have as much handling sounds. But those are some of the challenges you face. But that low noise mic, low self noise microphone, good amplification and a good system and you should do fine. Alex? Yeah, the, the the hard part is finding, you know, one of the things you want to look for is a great preamp to do this. Um, you know, the preamp is going to make a big difference exactly to what Bill was saying. You don't want any self-noise in the system. And the problem is, is anything that's going to interface with your iPhone generally isn't going to have a good preamp. So you are going to potentially, it's really about that interface. Um, so you can, with a, especially with the new iPhone um, or with an Android, uh, you can use... Um, you know, USB interfaces. And so looking for a quality USB interface is, is it may be something you want to think about. By the time you do that, you will have bought um, a Zoom H2n or H4n or something like that. You know, like you're, you're now buying a recorder. I don't know if I would try to record. Uh, if you're really looking for a subtle Nat Sounds, I don't know if there's, if there's a mic that really is going to be great going into your phone um, that isn't, you know, that, that is, isn't going to have a fair bit of self noise that's, that's available to it. So what you're asking to do maybe beyond what it, you, by the time you get it done, you'll just buy a recorder that has low sound. Yeah. You, you, you might find, you might laugh at me, but I've, I am often impressed with the sound that you get off of an iPhone, um, recording, um, that, that you can get some seriously good sound. And I would argue that having two or three different iPhones in different locations, I mean, four or five, um, in, in, a, in, a, uh, in the location, you could actually start to create some surround sound um, and even a mix in a stereo um, image with just the sound from iPhones. I think you could be really impressed with what you get out of that um, if you were just using phones. Um, particularly if you, you place them well, you don't have handling noise and things like that. But um, I'm often impressed with how how good that sound is off those phones. Chris? There's a lot to be said for uh, hiring a real professional to do something like this because there's nothing quite so awkward as a podcaster taking his mic out into nature and recording <laughs> the sounds of a desert. And this was me in a Joshua Tree a few years ago. And I felt like an idiot and the sound was, you know, eh, it was okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> it looks like you were ready to do a radio show out in the, out in the bush, as we'd call it. All right, next question. Tim Mann comes to us next from Melbourne, Australia. Is there any difference between the Behringer X Dante and the Clark Technic DN32 Dante? Alex? I don't think so from a functional mm. perspective. Um, I could be wrong, but I think they're identical other than I think that the Clark has typically been more expensive <laughs> than, than, the, uh, than the Behringer. Yeah, that's what I've seen. I, I saw it was about $100 difference in, in Australia. Um, and, uh, but they seem to have quite a lot. In the, I, I'm not sure of the company. I was trying to see if they were, if they were bought out by Music Tribe, but, that, but they're not, I don't believe. No, Clark Technic is, and, I mean, they make a lot of great pieces of hardware. So it's, 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 a, high, it's a really high quality um, company. And the one thing that has happened is oftentimes the Clark has been available when the, when the Behringer has been sold mm -hmm. out. So that, I think the only time I've, we bought one Clark Technic and I didn't notice any difference, the, the, but it was available and the other one wasn't. Yeah, so the, the moral of the story is get whichever one you can get because <laughs> they're hard to get sometimes. Yeah. All right, next question. JJ McKenna, San Rafael, California. Of the many affordable 3D printers on the market, which can reliably print to the most durable and hard materials for use with brass quarter 20 threaded inserts? And he needs it in purple. And someone who is often doing live streams of, of what's happening with the 3D printer is Jeffrey Powers. Jeff? Yeah, so I'm assuming you're talking about uh, you want polycarbonate uh, type filament printing and you're, we're talking regular 3D printer, uh, not, not, a, not a resin for 3D printer, but a filament style of, uh, 3D printer. Uh, so it, there's a lot of different factors. Uh, I can spout off the top two uh, brands that would work for you, the 
P, uh, what Prussia, Prussia PRUSA and their i3, and then you have Creality Ender. They just came out with the Ender 3, uh, which works really well. A lot of people swear on on uh, on printers where the bed actually lowers as you print rather than the head raising up because there's a lot uh, less chance of error. And of course, they're also more solid because they usually have four beams around the bed to raise it up and down, so it shakes a lot less. Uh, a lot of printers that uh, enclosing the printer is a very important factor uh, in uh, keeping things uh, as best as possible, keeping up with the firmware. Uh, I use uh, the Octa, Octaprint uh, uh, through a Raspberry Pi to do my printing, but uh, the firmware on, on, the, on my printer is actually a third party, and I can't think of the name of it right now. That's what I was trying to go. But the bigger thing is it's, it's also about that filament, what, whatever brand of filament you buy, because I've had filament that just completely fall apart. They collect moisture, and uh, it, once they start doing that, then they'll they'll just be horrible to print with. And there's ways to actually get rid of the the uh, the moisture inside of the filament uh, through uh, boxes and and things like that. Uh, so those are the those are the main factors in uh, getting uh, any type of printer for that matter. Fair enough. A whole bunch of information there. Thank you, Alex. Almost all the stuff that we've done, the where we where we're going to tap it with the quarter twenty, is has been using resin. So um, the resin is a lot higher resolution. It's a lot easier to manage. Um, we have tried to tap SL, uh, um, um, general extrusion stuff, and it's just really rough, you know, compared to the resin and much, much harder to um, make it work well. So I would highly recommend uh, the resin printers used to be really when, I, when we started doing this, they were really expensive. And now they're not. <laughs> so I think that they're down to about $180 or something, depending on the size. So you can get a resin printer, uh, relatively inexpensive, or SLA, um, and uh, I'd recommend that if you're if you're planning to tap it. Great. Next question. Lois Richter in Davis, California, says JPEG is a lossy format for still images. If I open a JPEG file, change something, and save it, I've lost a little bit. If I do that 10 times, I've lost a lot. Do you save your images to some non-lossy formats before you start editing? And if so, which? It's a great question about stepping on an image each time. Uh, Jeffrey, what do you got? Yeah, if you're coming, if you're starting with a JPEG image, the the best thing to do is just to make a copy of that original image, and then set that aside, and then do your work off of the uh, off of the secondary one, uh, or the copy, and then uh, and then be you can make your changes. Yeah, if you if it comes in as a JPEG image, what you see is what you get. And uh, with any photo that, for that matter. Now, the best part is if you're not using the in Mac or in PC tools like uh, Photoshop or, or anything like that, they're coming out with new AI tools that help uh, rebuild the image. So you would have not that problem. You'd still have problems because they still have to try and figure out how to fix the photo. Uh, like for instance, if you got uh, there's a company called Topaz, and they they have photo editors and they have video editors, and if you have a photo, for example, that is in a very low resolution, and where it's got text in the background, but the text is unreadable, if uh, if you put it into Topaz, and you blow that up to a, a big size, that text is still going to be blocky and blurry and and unreadable in that aspect. So, uh, the yeah, the best thing to do is the original photo, put it aside, make a copy, and then edit the copy. Okay, go ahead, Alex. Definitely agree with with uh, Jeffrey that you want to save that original somewhere else. Um, that you're gonna then maybe usually three places <laughs> is what you want. Two places, two non. You know, if 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 a, if, a, if a picture matters to you, have it saved in two different places, two physical places, and one in the cloud. Uh, three, two, one is the uh, I think what how they call that. Um, and so the uh, um, so if that if it matters, then look at that. As far as and trying to get back to that original. Uh, if you're editing it, it all, you always want to save it in whatever your editor is. You know, so save a version of that. If you're working in Photoshop, save it as the Photoshop file that you had there. Um, if you, if um, a you know, the, the lossless one that most of us will go to um, is typically a TIFF. Um, a TIFF file um, is is where we'll go um, to to save that out. If you're gonna if you're just gonna keep it as an archive, uh, it, it's usually a pretty solid one. Outside of again keeping it in the editing packages um, uh, format, 
uh, the you know obviously getting as much resolution out of the first one as possible. One thing that can improve not improve the compression, but smooth some of it out. If you have a really large photo that happens to be a JPEG, and this is why sometimes you want to, you know, you, you hope that it gets, you know, at a, you, you hope you get it at a high resolution. When you scale it down a little bit, the bicubic um, interpolation will sometimes smooth out some of the um, the compression artifacts. So, if, you know, that that can help a little bit, but you lose resolution. So, so those are the things that that's the difference between number of pixels versus quality of pixels. And so you can improve that by a little bit by um, by scaling it down if, if that makes a difference. There are some um, processes where people will scale it, um, scale it down to, to fill it in and then scale it back up again because the scale up is um, the the new scalers now nowadays are so good that sometimes you can get rid of some of the compression it's otherwise hard to get rid of so um, that doesn't always work uh, but but we have seen I've seen people do it I have not done that myself <laughs> but I've seen people do it and I was impressed but I just I was like ah that sounds crazy so anyway so the um, uh, so that those are th some things to look at, but yeah, you really want to save those originals. You're, you're not gonna, you you know, don't ever save something again as you edit it. It's gonna make it a lot bigger. But what you're doing is taking a little box and putting it inside of a big box. If you if you, if you save it as a JPEG, you just keep on making a smaller box <laughs> that you're putting it into as as you go down that path. Good back, Chris. What can you add to this? Well, I think it's an interesting thing. I I never really thought about this. It makes perfect sense, Lois. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago, I think it was Marquez Brownlee, he did a video where he down he posted a video and then he downloaded it and then he reposted it and, and he did that like a hundred times to show like how bad it got. And I think at about, you know, halfway through it was almost unrecognizable. But um, I'd love to see somebody do something like that. I'm, who knows? There's Apparently there's a lot of stuff on the internet. It may already be there. Uh where somebody's done that, you know, 20, 50, 100 times. Uh, I think that although it's absolutely going to be a thing, I think for most people, the vast majority, not not on this panel, they're not going to see a little extra compression. That's just my thought. But I'd love to see a, an example of it. I was waiting for you to talk about VHS tapes again. You know, we all used to I was going to I was trying tapes. to figure out how to um, work in something about AI, but... It escaped me. <laughs> you couldn't. Yeah, I would. I also would uh, think that, that often you can you can save the compression type. I I have seen in JPEG, and you can go to ten, and it's very little compression that it's doing each time. It makes a larger file size, and so it's possible to do it a little more. Um, oh, we're still we're, we're still wanting to keep. We're basically doing a second hour on JPEG compression here, uh, Sergey. I don't use JPEG anymore, but what I was going to say is if you use an iPhone and you use to take picture with it and you edit the picture within the iPhone, I think you will have less problem with that pro uh, with that JPEG conversion going uh, multiple times. And the other thing, you can revert back to the original easily. So at that point, you will go back to the original and start again and not having that compression problem. Final word, Jeffrey, quickly. Yeah, I would, well, what Chris said, I was going to well, I was going to talk about the Marcus Brownlee uh, video, but it'd be really cool if we did ran a test where we took a video, we uh, made the copy of it, and then we used some sort of AI like Topaz to correct it, and then made another copy. And did, that's going to take a lot of time to do, but it'd be interesting to see how Topaz or these AI uh, editors will start to uh, will keep up to make it look like a decent uh, decent video. Yeah. So you see, we spent a bit of time on that question. We've got uh, a few questions still to come, but now's a great time to put in questions. Still got another half an hour to talk uh, on your particular questions. So you could do that through Meccano, or you could use the QR code there or go to askofficehours.global. Thanks, Bill. What's the next question? Our next one comes from JB Windle in Thailand. He says, I need to purchase several new portable SSDs now that I can't get the Samsung T5 anymore and SanDisk has fallen from grace. Which drives do the panelists recommend? Bill? 
So I have moved to mostly NVMe since I wasn't able to continue to get the SanDisks. I use these sleds. This is actually, don't get excited by the price. This is just the enclosure. If you want a lot of memory in there, now I use them at one and two terabyte things that are not terribly expensive. Uh, if I pop here on the four terabyte, you'll see that it, that then all of a sudden memory inside can be expensive. But they're incredibly quick. They're incredibly reliable. And so far, I think I'm going to continue to go in this thing. One thing I like about buying the sleds is that if your memory requirements increase, you can just pop out the NVMe card from that. It takes five minutes to put a new bigger one in, and you have more drive capacity. So they're very convenient in that respect. Alex? Yeah, I, I have um, I've, I've done a little bit of both. Um, so I, I have the, the ones that I, we got, and this was actually based on our coverage of Cinegear. I bought a couple of the Oyen Digital Helixes. These are these little these little guys here. Let's see if I can get that to focus here. And so this is a nice little one, and you can get these on Amazon. Um, they're they're pretty fast um, as far as I think they go up to about a um, a gig um, of uh, of transfer or yeah. Anyway, so the um, uh, and then the other ones that I do is I do build my own NVMEs. The one thing to be careful of with the NVMEs, this is the Ineo, I think, is the one that kind of has it. And, and I like the fact that it has, you know, something I can attach things to. So having a little bit of a um, kind of a gun barrel type uh, allows me to attach to it more effectively. Um, and I can put NVME, uh, um, I can put NVMEs in it. Remember that there is a heat dissipation in the NVME. There's a little piece of, of, of um, it's like a, thi a, a spongy tape that you're going to put on it on that NVMe that attaches that actually presses up against the enclosure and uses the enclosure uh, to dissipate heat. Um, it's really important when it comes to speed. So so it's um, uh, so it's it's important to um, uh, if if it heat as it heats up. This is the problem with the T5 and the T7s is they didn't do that, and so they would once you got about 400 megs in, you would um, it would start to um, slow down. So these are the these are the this is the two types. I've got a bunch of the ones that I built. Um, the ones if I'm doing production, I have to admit, I use these for for my own stuff. Um, the ones that I built, I don't trust myself well enough. So I things that I, I I use the OEMs for the things that I care about, like or things that I'm getting paid to do. <laughs> so so that's um, as I've moved, and I still have a bunch of T5s and T7s that I use, but I don't. We don't capture to the T7s, uh, just just to the T5s. I thought uh, when you were looking at the side of that enclosure, I thought that looked like Lego pieces, which you've spoken about before. You put you put those Le Lego on the back of the of the laptop, and then you can stick them. You, it would be really cool if I could stick it out like that. Yeah, the the um, if you could stick it to the Lego pieces. Yeah, I actually have that. I think I have that laptop. The the um, the what what Grant's talking about. And I'll, Chris, go ahead and answer, and I'll I'll, I'll get the. We're gonna the, let so. Alex do a little spelunking. Yeah. What I was gonna say is, you actually can still buy T fives. They're just selling at a premium. I think they're about two or three x what they used to be. Um, so uh, it may be, <clears throat> excuse me, it may behoove you <clears throat> to pick up a couple of those. Also, Alex, I want to say because it's. There's going to be probably somebody right now is sending out a new question. You're going to have to put the link to those two devices that you just showed on like Twitter or something so people can find that. You're going to, uh, I'm curious. And is that really a Picatinny rail on the side of that drive? It is. It is. I'm sure. I, I don't think that they, I don't think that they, um, uh, they, so I don't, for, for those of you who are Second Amendment challenged, there's a whole system of yeah, mounting yeah, things so on gun barrels called it, Picatinny. It's, it is, it is a, uh, it, it's a, it, it, it just makes it a lot easier to attach, although I, I, I wouldn't recommend attaching it to. I don't know if the vibration or heat would be a problem <laughs> if you attach it to an actual gun. So, but, but the, um, but yeah, that's, it is, I think that, I don't even think they got creative. I think they just literally copied it. And said, "Oh, that'll be fun to put on the outside." It turns out that it's really, really good for gripping. So if you, if you, you know, if you get onto something for, you know, it, it's just, it makes it. If you're trying to attach it to something, it, as you would guess, it's good at it. That so, so anyway. If so. there's a reason for some reason in the future that you feel that you need to put a scope on your hard drive, it's going to be easier to mount yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. Oh, look at that. Talking about rails. Uh, oh. Chris getting close to the third rail there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The second, yeah, a little, second a little amendment. Nice rail. I was just trying to skip over it. So anyway, the exactly. um uh the uh the this is what Grant was talking about, which is I this is a very old laptop because they don't 
they don't seem to make this. It must have been some kind of copyright, you know, some kind of, you know, somewhat angry emailing. But what this is, is this is a uh, Lego top, obviously, that I spilled some tea on. I haven't figured out how to get that out. Anyway, um, but uh, a Lego top that I've had for, I don't know, this a decade and on this very old laptop. And um, basically, what it, it, it actually fits Legos. So you can see with the, these are actual, those little flat parts are actual Legos. I didn't put them up as design. What I did is I would I keep them there so that if I had things that I wanted to attach to it, I'd super glue those little flat pieces to my uh, to a hard drive or to a modem, and then I could just attach it. I could just push it on anywhere. I could just build like a little pattern on the back of my uh, thing of hard drives and everything else. If you're working when you're working in, um, at, at you know at a, at a show, being able to just pick your laptop up and you've got your modem and your hard drive and your you know anything else there that's all kind of just attached to the thing and you're not like collecting everything turned out to be super useful. Also, when you're in the airport, nobody mistakes your laptop for theirs. <laughs> you know, so, so anyway, so it, it, and I, you know, so I, we, we would constantly get shells for our laptops and I just replaced it with this top one. They don't make them anymore. I wish they did because they're amazing. I used to, when my son was little, I would, I would, uh, um, I needed the flat pieces and I was too lazy to get them myself. So I would just buy 500 pieces and tell him he can keep the rest of them if he just gives me all the flat ones. So he would just give, he'd just come back with, when he was like six, six, he would just come back with a pile of flat ones and end up with 500 more um, of Legos. Anyway, there you go. There you go. There's a great TV show that was uh, started here in Australia called Lego Masters, which, uh, which then America did. And uh, there's a New Zealand one as well, which uh, is fun to watch, but... Um, getting back to the original question, um, you know, the T5s, um, I've got a heap of T5s and T7s, and I don't have any problem. Um, what, what was interesting is I, when the um, ISO, the ATEM uh, Extreme ISO came out, um, Grant, another um, good name, he uh, demoed it with eight, uh, the eight ISO recording on a T7, and it was working fine. Um, now, I think if you were trying to record 8K, you know, raw, um, you wouldn't be doing that on a T7. But but eight times 70 meg per second, uh, which is which is what the uh, extreme ISO does, um, was working fine, and I haven't had any problems with that. Nine. Right. It, well, it's it's not nine. At, it's not nine at 70, right? It's eight eight times 70, and then depending on what your live stream setting is set to, is what it'll record the program out at which is crazy. And and uh, I will say that we've lost T7s recording from an extreme. Right. So so we've so I, I have personal experience of you know it, it was like oh I think that'll be fine because we knew that not to use them with the cameras because the you know the cameras turned all the way up can push the drive harder. We so we know that the T7s will you should not use with a 6K. Um, the, uh, but we were like, oh, we think we can get away with it with the, it, it's not going to be as big of a deal for the extreme and halfway through our show, it stopped recording. So, yeah, well, I have to admit, I have seen, you've seen the flashing light on the extreme just halfway through your show is a scary thing when it starts flashing fast. Um, but, but what this reminds us all is backup is really important, right? So having, and, having multiple forms of backup. And we weren't too stressed because we had two other copies of the program. We yeah. we lost some of the ISOs, but we had, oh, and we were recording in the camera. So all the cameras had records and that. So it was like, it'll be uncomfortable to put it back together, but not impossible. I have, I have done a setup recently where we had lots of Hyperdex and then right at the last, last step of the chain was an extreme. And I just had eight ISOs going into it just in case the Hyperdex weren't recording or whatever and sure enough someone didn't record and they they missed the first 30 seconds um and i had the recording because i just ran the extreme all day and it worked great so it's uh it is good to have backups um i was a little worried we weren't going to get to talk about jpeg um anymore um, today but thankfully uh, we've bill we've got another question about jpeg we do in fact lois richter is back from davis california she said if i edit a still image which starts as a jpeg in this case in max preview or photos what format is it using internally as i make changes does jpeg's lossiness only occur when i click the final save bill dive into this okay. big discussion on jpegs <laughs> 
It doesn't have to be that big, but here's the thing. You got an original. Now, in this case, if your original is already JPEGed, it's been compressed once, which means that all the data from the original sensor uh, will not be present in it. If you want that, you really want a format called RAW. And RAW really just reads the sensor data in, applies, if any, very minimal compression. Sometimes it has to. Particularly in cameras, though, they're just going to take that huge sensor. Normally, they're pretty big now in DSLRs and things like that. And it's going to write all the data. Then when you export is when you make the compression to a JPEG. As I mentioned in that first instance, if you start with a JPEG and then save it out as a JPEG, you're going through two compression passes, and that's always something that is not optimal. You don't want to compress an already compressed file because that's when those anomalies and problems are going to start building up. So if you can ask your vendors for a raw file to start over again, a, a new to do any processing. That's your best format. If you must do it, try to step on it as few cycles as possible. Don't make changes, then save that out, and then make changes to that and save it out. That is what will get you in trouble. Thanks, Alex. <clears throat> I believe that most of your color corrections, I mean, if you're just making color corrections or crops, um, um, I believe that for for photos, it is a, it, that's all metadata. So all the changes that you make in photos, because you're not really editing the pixels, you're editing the color, you're editing, you might crop it, you might rotate it. All of that data is metadata. Um, so you can always go back to the original and it's not resaving the file. So it's, it's holding that file and it has all the instruction sets. So when you hit export, it then exports it out as a, as a new file. Um, and if you, or if you save it out, but, but as it sits inside of Photoshop, it's just, or not in, or photos, Apple photos, it's just saving all the transformations you did to it. Um, and then it'll concatenate those at the end and, and export it out. Thank you, Chris. You know, we talked, <clears throat> I asked about this in the last question and Preto found this for me. Uh, this is, a, a on the website Petapixel. They uh, did a thing where they took these four formats, FLIF, WebP, BPG, never heard of these, and JPEG, and they saved them out 500 times. And then they made a video of the whole process deteriorating. We're up to 250 times right here, and it just gets worse and worse. So the far right one is the JPEG, and it certainly does uh, break up. I was also going to say that um, I think Serge mentioned something about doing stuff on your iPhone. You got to remember, when you're editing on the iPhone, it's not changing the image. It's creating a script that does all the stuff to it. So you can, like, come back to it later, and you haven't deteriorated the image at all yet. It just opens up the image, runs the script that does all the stuff to it, and then it goes, hey, look, that's why you can hit the revert button, I think. I'm pretty sure. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, That's I think I it actually stores. About. I think it stores the original as well, and so that you can you can always revert, revert back to that, and you can also um, duplicate easily too um, in photos, so that you can spin off another version of that. So I know that in um, Snapseed, which is an iPhone app, it has a script that you can step back through all the steps that you've done. Yeah, That's I think cool. it's just saving the steps. As I said before, it's just saving the metadata of all your all the all the operations that you're doing. I don't think it's it's not because you're not editing pixels. You're not going in there with a brush and moving the pixels around. It's just the transformation of of pixel values and position. I uh, I, I was joking about uh, about JPEG, but it it really does sound like it could be a second hour discussion as we talk about image images well, and, and compression. compression and how we manage how we manage our images so thank you we could also do a whole helpful. another second hour on bicubic compression and scaling there you go bicubic scaling no, we could do one one second hour scaling up and then another second hour scaling down, scaling down. <laughs> this is the first the first one will only be 35 minutes and the second one's bill. gonna be an hour and a half bill save us uh let's go to the next oh, no, question uh, 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 surge surge oh i just uh, want oh, to I'm mention sorry. that since the beginning we are talking about jpeg but remember that the iPhone, since a few years, is not using JPEG anymore as the the storage capture for for photos. Yeah, although I think you can change that though. Uh, there, there is a setting you can yeah, in, but the default, I think you're right. You, you um, it's not JPEG, but you can change it. 
And one more note, often cameras now, particularly DSLRs and things like that, will shoot both a raw image and a JPEG. So you can choose which one you want to use. You can work with the JPEG and, and maintain the raw photo or vice versa if you choose. Okay, moving on to the next okay. question. It's from yep. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. The X-Real experience on an S22 Samsung Android phone and on a USB-C M1 iPad are great. Android charges inductively, but the iPad only had a kludgy boxy X-Real beam converter. What would work better and stay minimal? Wow, I've gone a little, little deep with this one, Alex. Yeah, I think that I, I'm I'm trying to figure out what he's what Paul's doing there. Um, mm. My I, I'm using the the X Real and I'm just plugging it into I'm plugging it US the USB cable that came with it the USB C cable and you have to use the USB C cable that came with it. I don't know what is special about that cable, but it does not work without it. Um, and so uh, so anyway, so it it is um, uh, I plug that straight into my iPad and then I can I can uh, these are the I don't know. What, these are the glasses. I'm not going to put them on because I already have glasses on. I have to put my contacts on. But these are the. These are, they, they just look like sunglasses, but they have you know, they have little uh, screens inside of them. And have um, you got the cover on them? I put the, the cover, cover on them, on so them. then I don't have to. That way, I can see a whole screen. Um, you know, it, it just blocks everything out. It's. I can't. I mean, I'm actually. I'm not a big. I don't like to travel anymore, but. I kind of want to go traveling to see what it's going to be like to be on a plane and just like watching a movie with the headsets on and completely shut out. Um, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, anyway, but uh, uh, but I haven't had any trouble with the iPad, so I'm not sure exactly. Uh, I don't. I think the beam converter is to go from USB C to HD or to HDMI. But I think the, I thought that the beam converter, or if you want to do it wirelessly, I guess. But I'm doing it wired to the iPad, and it works great. I wonder if that. Uh, USB-C cable has the the uh, DisplayPort protocol in there as well, or something that that is requiring it, or something. But I mean, USB-C uh, specification is already um, vast, and so um, if this is another um, specification again, that would be very disappointing. But it could be that you have to keep using that same cable. Yeah, it seems uh, to drop out every couple seconds so, if you don't have the... Every other USB-C cable has been dropping out every couple seconds. And so it, it attaches but doesn't really work properly. And then I put the... I found the right one. I mean, I have so many that it just kind of was like, oh, okay, I got one. I set it down somewhere. I didn't care. Um, and I can't... And it, it has a nice little curve that extends from the, the ear so that it, mm. it it is a nicer form form factor than the ones that I was putting in there. But it should just work, and it doesn't. So I'm going to buy another one. Just and that's probably why. <laughs> whatever, whatever they figured out how to do. Yeah. All right. Next question. Next one comes from Peter Moore in Auckland, New Zealand. He's been playing with Reactor, I believe that's how you pronounce it, R-E-A-K-T-O-R, uh, from Native Instruments. And now I see that Arturia has released something similar. Thoughts? And he's got the Arturia link there as well. Uh, Alex, I think it's a good start. I think the real challenge is. Native Instruments has a lot of a lot of history here, so it's you know I think that that you know I think Arturia could you know I think that, that if you're using a, where it's going to go is if you're using Arturia hardware then you're going to go oh I'm really interested in the software, and everyone else is going to keep on using Native Instruments <laughs> you know like so so I think that it's a software that's going to be more designed and I, I imagine it's going to be more integrated with the Arturia hardware, um, but I think that otherwise Native Instruments is so embedded. Um, that would be a very, very difficult, that's a very uphill battle other than adding more revenue and, and more functionality to the hardware that, that they already have over time. Hmm. Jeffrey? Yeah, I tried to look at the Arturia. The, the link isn't working properly, so I, didn't, I couldn't do the comparison between the two. Uh, they're both great companies, so I, I would expect some good quality off of off of Arturia's uh, software. Uh, and of course, you get one company that's making something and becomes pretty successful. Other companies are going to come and, and have their own versions of the same product. So I'm not surprised that uh, that they're going to try to compete with uh, uh, with uh, try to compete and, and go back and forth. So we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see how it works, and and I'll I'll probably give it a try down the line here. Sounds good. Next question. Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Up next with a first-generation Focusrite Scarlett 8i6 with the Scarlett 
mix control software. Curiously, when reset to factory default settings, there is nothing assigned to the monitor knob. How to assign this functionality to the knob without software each time is his question. Go ahead, Alex. I do not think that's possible. So I think that if you if you you need the software to reassign that the the, the knobs to to reassign the functionality inside the focus right, um, you need to have software to do that. And uh, um, yeah, <laughs> so big... I, I I've unfortunately spent a lot of time with the Gen One Scarlets and um, of different sizes, not usually the eight by six, the eight i six, but the I think the two i two or whatever. And and. Mm. Uh, Man, do I dislike that piece of hardware. I like a lot of Focusrite stuff, the, but I, every time it comes up in our in our little discussions, I can talk about how much I dislike the Scarlets. <laughs> they, they just, and it's mostly just because I'm, I'm bitter about how much time I've lost trying to support people on the far end who are going to join my show with a Scarlet and there's something wrong. And it's happened as recently as a couple weeks ago. And I just really hate that piece of hardware. So, and I, I want my, I want the days of support back, back that I've that I've given. Yeah, to well, the, they're a great device when they work, and that the problem is that they often don't. <laughs> exactly. And, and, then, <laughs> and when they don't, they're really a pain to get to work again. Like, it, and it's mysterious. Like, it was working a second ago, and now it's not working at all. You know, and or or, or it's you know crunchy, or it's doing something else. I mean, there's just so many hmm. things that go wrong with it. I agree with Josh. Oh, it is curious that it would reset the factory reset would disable. Um, at the knob altogether. Chris? I'm just shocked to hear Alex say <clears throat> that he's bitter. He doesn't seem like a bitter person. I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter about most things. I, I'm just bitter about that piece of heart. Really? <laughs> and that was that was special comments from Chris Fenwick. Thank you. Next question. Situationally bitter. Uh, Dave Kaufman's up next from Vancouver, BC. In my career, I found high correlation between good engineers and having grown up building Lego. Oh, and having grown up building Legos at the toy. What's the panel's experience on that? Mm -hmm. Alex? I don't think that the Legos necessarily, I don't think that the Legos are what created people being good engineers. I think people who tend to lean towards being engineers tended to want to use Legos. You know, like you you wanted to have this thing that you could kind of build. I, I definitely grew up with a lot of Legos and Lincoln Logs and Tinker Toys and and then, you know, then we then we had an arc welder. <laughs> you know, when I, as, as of, by the time I was twelve, we were just little make little smiley faces. Growing anyway, so me. um so anyway, the uh um uh, so I think that it just depends on 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 I think that's the type of person that wants to use Legos is also the type of person that may end up as an engineer. Hmm. Jeffrey? First of all, the plural for Lego is Lego. Just so you know. Anyway, uh, it, it's just a little pet peeve of mine. Uh, I grew up on Erector sets, and I miss Erector sets because of the fact that they have all the, you, you actually have to put screws to it. Legos are great. Are, I just did it. Lego is great, and, uh, and is definitely a thing. Lincoln Logs, uh, and uh, well, I had another one in my head that I completely forgot. But nowadays, they have these really cool wood puzzles that you can get and you can make clocks and you can make, uh, I have a, couple, a few of them that I made. We did a little marble run thing with these. Uh, so basically it's all wood burned, uh, etched and you just pull out the parts and then uh, take toothpicks and put it all together. So any type of creati creativity like that is gonna be great for any type of engineer. Chris? I think what you're looking for is patience and problem solving ability. Um, I don't think I'm a great engineer. I'm, a, I'm great at troubleshooting. And sometimes that just takes patience, thinking through something step by step. Uh, in regard to a <clears throat> Lego, uh, when I was nine years old, I won a, a one third prize in a worldwide Lego contest. I'm pretty good at Legos. Wow. And, and you use the plural just then as well. So, I um, I don't listen he was, to most of what Jeffrey says. He was he was good at like he's good at he's yeah. good at Legos. He's not good at English. <laughs> so, I'm gonna so start using leg guy as the plural. What is <laughs> what is interesting I think about this is that uh, the, the there is an engineering aspect, so there's a there's a science aspect to it. Um, that I think uh, builds on that engineering idea. But then, then it brings in some artistry or some creativity or the arts 
um, when you're creating something out of nothing or creating something out of these Lego pieces. And I've, I think that's the same with music, right? That, uh, that there are often people that will approach music in a, in a, um, a scientific way. Here's the notes. This is how it needs to be played. And then there comes some artistry that, that, that comes in and there's a creativity that comes in. Um, and that's what we want to see. I think it's, I'll also I think say it's great. real that's quickly that Lego took a turn when everything became like a pre-built kit, like follow this instructions and you can build the, the Batmobile Tumblr, which by the way, I did buy. I haven't actually built it though. I was more satisfied buying it than I think I'm going to be building it. Then you had the, the deconstructors Chris. that t- would take Lego, build it, and then they'd try to deconstruct it to put it back in the box so they could build it again. It's, that's a big thing for Lego builders. Wow. Well, Chris, you won't be surprised that my son, who is also into Rubik's Cube, and that you were too, um, is also big into Lego. And so um, I guess maybe I'm looking at the old version of my son right now. That's exciting. Sad. I'm uh, sad for you. There you go. Um, Bill? When you're a kid, Lego is about learning building skills. As you become older and older, you discover that Lego is about pain tolerance because they're always on the floor in the dark of night when you're walking barefoot to the bathroom, and it's nasty. That's all I'll say. Serge? Just to go back to what Chris was saying, uh, I, myself, when I was playing with Lego younger, they were not pre-built kids and just had to invent something but my kids and all the generation following they are not good for that they just follow the instruction they're very good to follow the instruction and build a kit but after that you try to get them to imagine something new they never did right okay next question J.J. McKenna in San Rafael, California. Oh, I like this one. How difficult or facile is the process of pausing a 3D print to drop a magnet into a design that would allow the inclusion of embedded magnets into a final 3D printed component? Mm, Good question, Jeffrey. If you're talking resin prints, I think that's almost... I, I don't know if that's difficult, uh, impossible, but it's super difficult to do. But when you're talking about a filament print, you basically, uh, or extrusion print, you basically uh, tell the printer, and that's why you'd have something like Octoprint installed on your printer, to stop at a certain layer. And within that, that's where you put in your, either change your filament or you can then uh, drop in a magnet or, or anything like that. But most of the times the magnets usually have to have that front face. So I've built a few 3D prints with magnets. I actually built the uh, lower torso uh, um, scale for my, for my wife so she could have something to, to point at. And uh, you will know, use magnets. So in, or what I did there was I printed the part. It did have a little placement for the magnet and I did have to do a little bit of extra reshaping to put the magnet in but then I'd glue the magnet in and uh, and go from there and of course that's the other thing is if you're just placing the magnet in there's a there's always a chance that it could just pop right out because there's nothing holding the magnet in like a glue or anything like that Hmm. okay next question Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Back again. Bluetooth implementations vary wildly with respect to latency. What latency should I expect from the Audinate Dante Avio Bluetooth adapter? Alex, my experience is almost zero. I got. I don't think that there's any. I don't think there's any. Um, I don't even hear. I don't. I, I might hear just a little bit of a phase, like just a little bit off when I'm if I'm listening to it coming back. But I have one. I don't have it hooked up right now. But it's it's not zero, but it's less than ten milliseconds. Yeah, I've I've got one too, um, and, and I've used it a bit. I guess I haven't needed to test the um, the latency on it. It hasn't been a, a big deal, but I've been able to do calls and things like that um, with it. It's worked great, so um, it's negligible. All right, next question. Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas. The HTTP2 rapid reset flaw, which was exploited to launch record-setting DDoS denial of service attacks, requires patching every web server before the problem can be eradicated. Discuss. Mm. Serge? I will not discuss a lot about that because I think it's sure you need to update your servers but anybody that manages a server knows that and after that if you are susceptible to be a target of the ddos 
then you need to be behind a cloud flare or something like that to protect yourself. And they already have mitigation for that new attack. So I don't think it's a, a go crazy and be afraid moment. Fair enough. Jeffrey? Yeah, I was totally going to agree with that. Uh, basically, the uh, if you have Cloudflare or Cloudflare was one of the three companies that actually uh, discovered it. And AWS was the other one. I was trying to find the third one. Uh, but all, both of them have been uh, attacking the problem the second that they found it. And of course, a lot of these problems, they start to, uh, if, if you find it, you start to attack it uh, to, f to make a fix before anybody else, before you start publicly announcing it. Uh, so there, my understanding is there's, there's still a lot of, uh, you, there's still not a, a good fix for it just yet. So if you start by protecting with something like a Cloudflare or, or AWS on your front end, you'll be fine uh, and you won't get the, uh, the, the attacks, but it will also tell you if you're starting to get attacked and then you can take appropriate measures to make, uh, to fix that so your site doesn't go down. All right, next question. Douglas Carmichael up again. Aura, the MSG Sphere, Sphere spokes bot, is said to be able to learn from patrons and adjust accordingly. Could that be done with a large language model backend connected to the robot? And he's got a link there. Uh, John. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure. So Sophia was the first robot that they connected LLM to. It's, this is an absolute no-brainer. And you're going to have LLMs connected into the A lady and Siri here soon. So so this this will be a no brainer. And then feeding back the 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 responses back to to train further train the model is a no brainer. Yeah. Chris? I'm not sure what this question is asking, but when I started doing live sound, I had a, a older guy who was training me tell me, he goes, look, this is easy. Uh you stand back here at the mixer, you watch everybody's head. And as long as they're doing this, you're doing a pretty good job. The minute they start doing this, looking back at you, you're doing a bad job. A little bit uh, of oversimplification, but it would be really interesting with something as technically advanced as the sphere. If you could monitor people's like, um, what's it called, Alex? Uh, eye tracking, almost like eye tracking of people and watch their attention span. And if they start to like go down to their phones to examine it and go, is there something wrong with the sound at this point? And can we shape and re EQ? I mean, yeah. I, I don't know if there's anything. I think you know, it'd be I, hard. I think the thing is, is that it would be, sorry, I didn't put my hand up. No, <laughs> I think, I think it'd be hard to, um, there's so many factors there. I mean, so what I will say is that when I, um, when I'm speaking and I see people look down or I see them, the most important thing I've talked about in the past is blink rate. If, if their eyes are blinking slowly, um, I, will, uh, I am immediately am analyzing what I'm saying. Like, like I'm thinking in my head about like, what am I saying? And it's two things. It's either I'm being boring or um, I'm providing too much information at one time. So I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelming the system. And so then usually I tell Joe, <laughs> so, so like, 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 you know, like I, I you'll, you, it, it looks like I'm ADD on a, when I'm speaking at NAB or something like that, but I'm usually like, I can see people slowing down. Like they're like, and, and I just go off and I, and it'll look like I just jumped off the rails and I'll tell some little story about farms or things or whatever. And I'm giving them air and hopefully trying to wake them up a little bit, um, to make that, to make that actually happen. But I'm, but I'm paying attention to all of that. And then the other thing I will say is that we found that when we, uh, will watch the data and you'll see all kinds of stuff. And if you go back to the video, you can always see what happened. But I don't know if it would mm. be the music mix. Maybe. Uh, I, I know that, Do, um, I'm sorry. You know, we're, we're running, we're running long on, at the end of the hour. So we should, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, two quick questions. Let's go, Bill. So I just wonder if I want a pre-show Las Vegas crowd into the sphere to be what's training my large language model. Having been to Las Vegas for many NABs, that pre-lubricated pre-show crowd may not be the best training source for your LLM. Just saying. Okay. Um, John, you want to say something quickly? Nope. Okay. 
Jeffrey you mean me says only quickly. Yeah, yeah uh, yes, really sorry. quick. They're already doing this. Uh, there's uh, and I, I put a link in Makana where the, on the outer part of the sphere, they have like a little smiley face. And if you're on the wind golf course, there's this one hole that's pointed right at the sphere. And what will happen is when you tee off, it'll actually, the, the smiley face will actually look at you hitting the ball, directional where the ball is and where it's going and its reaction to how you shot it. So they're doing it outside. I don't know about inside, but uh, it's already happening. Yeah. Well, we've, we've come to the end of our first hour. <clears throat> We're about to start our second hour. Um, I would uh, recommend that you go to officehours.global. If you aren't already, make sure you're signed up to the, uh, to the email. You get it every day, and it means that you know exactly what's happening every day and you can keep uh, abreast of what's happening. Um, it's, it's particularly handy because you can put questions into the QR, the QR code. So you go to um, askofficehours.global and you could do it there. That's the end of our first hour. And welcome back to our second hour. We're very excited to have uh, a special guest. It's a, a very specific and interesting topic. And um, what you'll find with the Office Hours community is that we are generally all very curious. And so it almost doesn't matter what the topic is, we're going to have a good discussion about it um, because we're just fascinated by it. Um, I particularly um, am, a, a, one of the things I do is a sound engineer for an acapella uh, group. And one of the places that we go into all the time is big cathedrals. Um, and so I get to mix sound um, in large cathedrals and um, it's, uh, it, it's fun. Like it's, it's, a, it's a challenge and it's fun. Um, but someone who knows way more about that um, than I um, is Michael Holmes. Uh, welcome, Michael. Well, thank you so much. Um, we'll, we'll see how much I know compared to you, but uh, I think <laughs> that uh, I, I was uh, really pleased to hear that lead in that uh, you have the experience in acapella because uh, it's a good segue, I think. There you go. Um, well, I'm interested. I know that you've got a few slides and a thing and things to show us, but just before you get into that, just just a little snapshot of sort of a, a, a history of how it is that you've um, that you've come to get involved in this type of thing that you're doing. Sure. For the last thirty years or so, I've, I've uh, other than being involved in modern orchestral playing and uh, uh, conducting and uh, you know, going through music school and everything, I became interested in early music, and particularly that's music uh, in Western music history. Uh, there's a dividing line to the death of Bach, which is uh, uh, J.S. Bach, 1750, and then everything before that we, we uh, generally call early music, and then there's modern music, the modern era after that. And so I've become a really big specialist in the, in the early part of that. Um, since 1997, I got involved in playing in a Renaissance brass group uh, that was one of two, uh, two major types, uh, groups of its type in the country that tours and does concerts. And uh, it's called the Washington Cornet and Sackbutt Ensemble. And the word Sackbutt is interesting because uh, it, it sounds kind of a, like a funny name, but it's really the predecessor for the trombone, the ancestor. And uh, I can talk a little bit about that. And then uh, from 2000, so that was 1997. And then 2000, I got involved in larger projects that involved voices and instruments and organs and continuo instruments and everything for large spaces. And uh, that's a little bit of, about what I'm going to talk today, uh, talk about today. So. And so uh, there's, there's obviously that musical journey um, mm -hmm. that, that you went on. What, what's interesting is we, we, we were speaking before about uh, engineering and Lego and playing with Lego. And I was talking about uh, how kids play with Lego and it's like there's an engineering aspect to it, almost a science aspect. And then there becomes um, an art that comes out of it. Uh, I'm interested um, with you, what is it like with music? were you first approaching it from an art or from a science and and how has that possibly changed over the years well i think uh because i'm synesthetic i see things through different senses so shapes so if you're talking about legos and parts of music or or, or sections of the ensemble i think of architecture in the music 
And uh, I don't know if I'm going in the right direction that you're going uh, hmm. with that question. But uh, uh, yeah, I see blocks of sound. Uh, uh, I actually have a condition where I can actually uh, see colors when I hear music of certain keys, that, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. It's not quite as vivid as, as some people with the same condition. We don't, I wouldn't call it a condition. I'd call, I call it a blessing <laughs> because the multisensory experience is, uh, is, is so great. And so you have architecture, you have sound, you have the visual part, and sometimes I can uh, smell things when I hear as well. Wow. Uh, it's a true story. That's fascinating. Uh, one of the things that we want to get onto uh, into your uh, presentation, uh, one of the things I think about when we hear music in large um, halls and cathedrals is that the room becomes an instrument in its own right absolutely um mm -hmm. and and I'm, I'm interested to hear how um how that has has played out for you and how you might be playing the room yeah i'm trying to think of the the, the quote is it seiji ozawa who was the, the music director of the Bo uh, boston symphony for many years and mm -hmm. uh somebody was asking him said why do we need a conductor and uh because it wouldn't a metronome be enough and uh then uh, his answer to that was, uh, well, the instrumentalists, the, the, the players in the orchestra, they play their instrument, but I play the orchestra. <laughs> mm. So it's, it's sculpting, sculpting sound, you're creating architectures and sound. Um, but when you're, you're dealing with early music, it's a lot more interesting because you have, uh, you know, irregular spaces. Uh, I'll talk a little bit and maybe we'll see some pictures of domes in San Marco and Venice, for example, and how those spaces get filled, whether they get fully filled or whether they don't is a matter of the architecture. Uh, and, uh, you know, some people today when they build a concert hall, you know, with the reflectors and all of those things, they're keenly aware of, of uh, you know, sound tests that they make in different mm. parts of the hall. But it's amazing mm. that in some of the Gothic cathedrals of the past, how perfect some of those uh, some of those acoustics were, um, and another example of that, uh, I, I would ask people, especially sound engineers, what was the microphone of the time for a priest in a cathedral? And it was that little reflector dome above them. The sound yeah. just shot off into the into the cathedral, and right. uh, these instruments can do that very naturally in that space, and they don't have to have large bores, and they don't have to be huge instruments they just fill the space that's great well hopefully uh, for our audience uh, that are listening that's been enough to whet your appetite <laughs> of uh, of what what is to come in this conversation so i'm reminded to ask questions so you can ask questions now all the way through if you're in Makani, you can do it there otherwise um ask officehours.global um so i'll hand over to you michael and and uh, share your presentation that'd be great well, I think because the appetite has been whetted, maybe I can ask my colleague Marty Atias here to play one example so they can hear what this is all about um, with the instruments and voices together in, uh, in imitation, I guess, of what it might have sounded like in San Marco. But I actually will talk a little bit about that specific space and its reverb. But Marty, if you could play the example, it's the uh, Giovanni Gabrielli Omanu Mysterium from Quemvidistis. There, that's the three minute one. So they can.
Thank you, Marty, for that fade out there. Um, so, um, just a little bit about uh, that uh, um, example. That was in collaboration, my group in collaboration with the Washington Bach Consort, which is a uh, Baroque ensemble uh, that uh, in Washington, D.C. area. Uh, we call it the DMV. Um, and it uh, is, uh, the group is 40 years old, and then we collaborated with them in uh, that space particular, particularly is very live compared to San Marco. You can see the images that were inside there. Um, that space was the National Presbyterian Church in American University there, which has a gorgeous acoustic, you can hear. And that was recorded using a, a, just one stereo pair behind me and uh, 10 feet up about. Uh, I, I'm approximating, I think, I think that's, that's what it was. And uh, the sound just circulates. So I, the architecture will determine what you want to do with it. And some places are trickier, you know, if they're drier, you can have mics in what I call choirs in the polychoral context. So Grant would know this. Uh, you have uh, different choirs at different positions of the space and uh, you know anywhere up to eight choirs in a, a famous piece called uh, Spem in Aulium by Thomas Tallis. Uh, I won't give that example today, but you can have any number of choirs just spaced in different places around uh, the cathedral. And this one was just the result of uh, the, the stereo pair hearing uh, what was the sound that was going up. We had to find the sweet spot for that. So that was nice. Um, San Marco is, is a lot drier, you know, than, than that is. But uh, it also sounds, uh, it will affect the tempo that we d determine to perform the music. Uh, I have to do it slower and grander in, in, a, in, in a live space and uh, a little quicker in a not so live space. Yeah, I was just gonna ask that about, because as I was listening to it, I was trying to hear the, the, the time because, mm -hmm. because so much of the sound was coming, coming and going and different parts are sort of coming and going. And it would be, it is a different experience depending on where you are in the room, right? As to, as to what you hear at what time. Mm -hmm. um, and so trying to do uh, things that have a strict time doesn't work very well, but something that has that, that kind of flowing feel about it, which is what that did have. And I guess that was the type of music that fit, would fit the space as well. Is that right? Yes. Um, and, um, I, I do see queued up there, Marty, I think if you could share the second array that we have there, there's a array of microphones in that space. It's the one that is the Gabrielli setup, I think. Let's see. You just had it before. There it is. Yeah. You can pin it up. Is it pinned up? Okay. So um, the one, if we're seeing, I don't know if we're seeing both of them, but the one on the bottom just has, uh, you can see the microphone circled behind me. And we have three choirs in that, uh, in that instance. We've got soloists or we call favoriti, which is funny. The Italians call them the favorites, <laughs> the ones that are um, uh, singing the solos. And then uh, the cappella choir in the middle, I think that's what it says uh, there. I'm not, look, I'm not seeing the full screen now. And then uh, at the top, if we are looking at the image of uh, a piece by Heinrich Schutz, which I'll play a little bit later, it's uh, Psalm 150, a setting there is uh, sort of, you could say it's four domes around where the conductor or moderator, as we would call it of the time, was called, uh, four choirs. So the favoriti in front of me, um, on the top left and right, the soloists, and the X's are individuals, and then the capella choirs down below. So choir, choir one and choir two down below, or choir three and four. So a choir of this period would be either voices or instruments or a combination of both. And you have a lot of uh, sonic possibilities of what to choose to double the voices with and, uh, and everything. 
But uh, that just gives you an idea of the mic array there. Um, and uh, if you can go back to that image, Marty, uh, I wanted to also talk about um, somebody with the, the the technology. Give me the name: the Sphere Microphone Array. What is that? Is that the right? What we call it Ambisonic. Um, yeah, we called it at the time. This was 2001. A recording that we did, which I'll play a little bit later. Um, I thought it looked like the Death Star to me, and I we were afraid that it was going to shoot us at different places around in this circle. We had a little phasing problems with that with that uh, uh, setup because we were all in a circle, and maybe uh, miking techniques have gotten better over the years, or to figure out you know how they work out the phasing problems of uh, going from one side of the circle to the other side. And, uh, and it be, be, depending on how live the space is, whether it's going to bank off of the wall and get into that other microphone over there, it's just crazy. Um, I'm glad that I do only music, but we had to negotiate you know, and figure out in the mixing between the four sets of microphones that were with the four choirs and then mm -hmm. the, the big uh, Death Star in the middle, uh, which was and, giant. And it was about two feet in diameter. It was, it was really big. Wow. So. How many, how many uh, sort of sends were you getting from that? Was, was that mixing down itself into a stereo pair or were you getting each individual microphone out of the sphere or how was, do you, do you know? Well, in post, I was, I was there with the, with the engineer. Um, we were hearing, you know, okay, here's one channel, here's one channel, here's one channel, here's the whole uh, effect and here's only the, uh, the center and here are the choirs without the center and that sort of thing so we tried to get it uh to where we were mixing everything together but i think if i recall correctly it was going from ends of the circle to the other where we had the phase problems yeah i i i, I could be mistaken but you know that, you that giant you spherical array go ahead you, you don't know how many tracks you had off of that oh mic? i'm thinking about eight tracks maybe yeah yeah, it wasn't individual, you know, the, the, the individual choirs, say if you had uh, four instruments and three or four voices, the solos with those instruments on that choir, it was just a stereo pair in each group, mm. I think, and not individual people. That would seem to have been chaotic for me because it sort of gets away uh, from the historical effect of what you're trying to achieve is, well, you've got somebody just sitting in there, whether it had been 500 years ago, a priest they're hearing mm. the effect of this glorious music or or an audience member being in that space being surrounded maybe by uh, a large circle you know or something it, yeah i think i think that's the <coughs> that's always the trick with with recording is trying to replicate the experience we think of being in for live recording trying to be there but the mm -hmm. the challenge is what is the best position in that building to to hear is it is it standing where the conductor the, the moderator was right in the middle of all mm -hmm. of that is that the best audible experience or is it somewhere back where you're hearing more of the room or uh, what, what I, guess, I guess there's pros and cons in both right there there's so many variables there it's also depending on what effect you want to create you want to create a, a purely historical effect with, with uh, uh, things being very much in the distance, or sometimes they pan and sometimes they, uh, they get closer. So I'm thinking of one particular group called the Gabrielli Consort in London. They recreate actual uh, ceremonies in, uh, that include the smells and bells, you know, <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 uh, the incensor or whatever it's called, where the, where the where the smoke is going out and, and and all of that you can hear the priest doing all of that and then the music happens sometimes you'll have a, a line of trumpets 12 trumpets or so and they're outside the uh the the entrance into the church and they sort of walk in with some drums and they come closer to the mic you know that whole effect so that's one effect that you want to do and i tend to not be all about the smells and bells and the costumes and all of that but just the sound let's hear what this music sounds like for, for what it is. And then we try to get the best array that we can. Um, and, um, you know, starting with the, the brass ensemble uh, itself, um, I see that Marty has queued up this one, uh, just the purely our group first as one entity 
maybe we can play that example. That's the Priuli uh, Canzona A6. So you can hear what they sound like alone and the effect of this recording here. So that that's one block of sound, you know, just one block of sound there. Yeah. And uh, and you were asking, so was I on the track of your question? Sorry, yeah, I was just going to say, is that, is that a harpsichord or was it a, a pipe organ in, in there? I couldn't quite... That was in the middle, in the middle of the ensemble. So we had the cornetto, uh, the cornetti or cornets, uh, which I'll, I'll show you a diagram of in a little bit, uh, on the left of the organ, and then the early trombones, which are called sackbuts, or in Italian, tromboni, on the right. And so you had the high, the high instruments on the left split by the organ in the middle. So that's a, because a, a continual organ or a positive organ, it's basically one that you can roll around and uh, some people call it a portative, but that's kind of a medieval, that's a medieval organ there. But uh, you roll it around because you, the reason we use that instead of a regular church organ is because uh, if, in order to get the temperaments, the tuning systems that, uh, that these groups, uh, historical groups that use period instruments would play with, uh, we have to use the historical temperament. We'd have to uh, tune the entire church organ to that. And that would be thousands of dollars to do that, to tune all the ranks. So we use a smaller version of that and use only the eight foot and four foot and two foot pipes that, that fit into that little chest, a wind chest there. And it's pretty, they sound pretty subtle. They're kind of wimpy, but, uh, they work and you can turn them up in the recordings. <laughs> if you want, you put a microphone right into the, into the chest there. So, but then I had at the very beginning of that clip, you could see, um, you know, how uh, architecturally that block of sound, uh, the image there was the organ pipes sticking out, the trumpet pipes going out. Mm. Uh, it, it's uh, kind of analogous of that. And you would see stops on, on a modern church organ. You will see the stops that are called trumpet and some that are called sackbut and some called cornetto, some called uh, dulcian. These are all early music instruments. So they keep the old names from the period that I perform. With, um, so maybe I, I thought what I could do is uh, go into that. Maybe people are interested in the uh, that big array, hearing something from that recording session with that big array, with the big uh, yeah. circle. I don't know if unless yeah. you had to take it another direction. We've got a few. We've got a few questions, oh, questions. here. Oh, okay, <clears throat> sure. sure. Um, so maybe we could do a few questions and then we could come back to that. Would that work? Sure. Um, so yeah, Bill. What yeah, have we got there. Yeah, the first one comes from Dave Troutman in Edmonton, Canada, and he's wondering: Do Fibonacci sequences play a role in these historical structures? Um, uh, that hasn't been my research, uh, but I'm interested in that. Uh, uh, you know, I know that there are some people who see Fibonacci in everything. Uh, <laughs> They say, oh, I see a circle, or I see something that looks like a shell or conch shell or whatever. It's Fibonacci. Well, I think you have to do the measurements and figure that out, or maybe research the, the architect themselves, you know? Um, you know, one classic example comes to mind, uh, the uh, um, Brunelleschi's dome in, in Florence, right? This is a Renaissance structure, right? I don't see Fibonacci in that. I guess you could fit it in there, uh, proportion-wise, but really it's... The Renaissance structures are more like, you know, uh, neo, uh, neoplatonic, you know, going back to the, the neoclassical style. Uh, and um, so with the architecture in mind, that's also that also determines where we place the instruments, uh, if we're doing something visually, at least, you know, we certainly don't want to go all the way in a corner 
in play if it's just the sound that we're creating and trying to record that. But I, I do want to point out also one interesting um, aspect of, of, of the sound and space and architecture is that uh, when people would perform, and this relates to the Fibonacci thing, if, you were, if you've been to the National Cathedral uh, in Washington, D.C., it's such a large space. If you play in the middle of that thing, uh, everyone sounds like ants. I mean, you can't hear anything. You put a, you put an orchestra in there, it's just terrible. But uh, historically, I know, and a lot of people who've seen how they did things uh, from, let's say, before 1550 or so, the ensembles were really small. So you go into a church and you have all these little chapels on the side, you know, li little tiny chapels where, you know, there's candles in there and, uh, you know, votive uh, candles and all kinds of things. And uh, they would just perform a service in there with a small amount of music musicians, maybe six to eight or so. And it sounds really resonant in there. And then there's a tiny dome and it sounds really loud right there. But you step out into the main, the nave, you can't hear anything. So it really depends on what you're talking about. Like, um, I'm sure, I, I think the, 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 uh, let's say the neoclassical era or the Renaissance, uh, I think people were interested in all of these mathematical things. And they uh, rediscovered everything after the Dark Ages. Um, and if they saw patterns and things, uh, I'm sure they, uh, that got them high, you know, <laughs> that was really cool to think of. But yeah, I, I have thought of it, you know, that, you know, you can fit that, uh, that whole spiral in there, I guess, if it's a, if it's a, what is it, a rectangle or just a perfect square? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I've got another question uh, okay. kind of along those lines. Uh, Dave Kaufman is right back again from Vancouver, British Columbia. It's pretty impressive that these spaces have excellent reverb, but avoid having echo. I wonder how the architects spoke about this distinction. What do we mean by avoid having echo? Let's see. The spaces have excellent reverb, but avoid having echo, like San Marco in Venice. I guess it's I guess it's the bounce, right? Like a, like mm -hmm. hear, hearing hearing it bounce rather than just the 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 sound or the decay of the sound. Mm -hmm. um, versus it actually hearing bounce and, and actual bounces and, and hearing repeated um, mm -hmm. sound. Know, if, 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 is there a distinction there? Well, I know that every architect is different and some have a musical mind and some don't, and some have somewhere in between, or if they had a, a musician uh, or sound engineer in, in modern times, if they do a, a, a neo-Gothic cathedral that's made you know, in the 20th century, an acoustician could say, how that would all work. Um, what's interesting, um, uh, Marty, do we have a picture of San Marco in Venice? Um, there, if you can cue that up or put that in. Uh, maybe the three pictures they're seeing, those are the domes there, and there's the interior. Yeah, let's just stay on the interior there. Um, that looks, if you look in there, you'd think that um, everything would just be absolutely resonant it would echo forever right you see all these caverns it's like going into a uh, a cave or something like that but what's mm. interesting is the architects uh, or whoever made the decision to put the mosaics on all the surfaces these are like glass mosaics um these are medieval mosaics there and they just break up they just chip away at the the bank you know the banking and everything. And so I went in there and I've clapped in that place and in different areas of San Marco. And uh, this is where all this Venetian music by Giovanni Gabrielli was written for this particular space in the early times of music that was polychoral, you know, they're performing in the different domes and everything. And I mm. think that it is uh, one of the musicologists that I talked to one time said that the mosaics were there uh, intentionally to break up that sound to just provide less echo and to um, to provide more clarity so that everyone can hear each other. Because if you've got, uh, say, uh, eight choirs of instruments and voices and the organist in the very center of the whole place, and they're looking up, you'd imagine uh, one choir on one end of the basilica and another one on the other end of the basilica, and they're playing at the same time, uh, right? So light travels way faster than sound right so they have to mm. trust their eyes rather than their ears but but uh i understand that people who, i've never performed in san marco but people say it's not as hard as it looks because there's clarity in there 
You know, mm-hmm. it, it's 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 easy to hear the other choir over there without hearing their echo only. So I performed in uh, what is it, the uh, Basilica of the uh, Shrine of the Immaculate Conception at Catholic University in Washington D.C. And it just goes and goes and goes and goes, and you don't know what's what. <laughs> you don't know what, and you have to rely on a conductor or a moderator to see their beat. Trust your eyes and not your ears. It's crazy sometimes if you have up to a six six second reverb. You know how, how much uh, you're talking about um, music that was specifically written for a room. Um, how much mm-hmm. does that then translate to another, you know, to another space? Um, obviously, that would have happened quite <laughs> a lot, but it, right? But there would have been, but this was was written and to be performed and played within this space um, specifically, and it doesn't necessarily translate. Well, I did mention before is that it's up to the performer, or the modern performer at least, to uh, to take these original pieces and see where these blocks of sound how they line up and experiment. Um, you know, and figure out our tempo. Uh, if you're going to do, I don't know, a, a double choir piece by Palestrina, which is just purely choral, um, it's a lot of swimming sound, a lot of beautiful major chord sounding um, harmonies, and they don't sound like there's they ever hit the ground ever. So if you want that effect, if the priest says, oh, this is what I want, you know, the clergy is like, this is the sound of heaven, this is the actual sound of heaven, um, then maybe that effect would be intended, right? I find Palestrina personally a little dull because it's too pretty all the time. So you need a little uh, dissonance for spice of, to put in, and that's why Gabrielli is great, <laughs> because he puts mm-hmm. in these crunchy chords and everything, and you have to have clarity for that. So um, so mm-hmm. if, you're, if I'm doing Gabrielli in a large space, I'm going to take the tempo down much slower in a large space like the the, the uh, first Presbyterian in uh, in Washington D.C., so that people can hear all the parts, you know, uh, mm-hmm. all the, the the starts and stops, or the moments, points of arrival, the big two Ds, which is when everyone's together. And uh, so it's uh, it's interesting and can be nerve wracking if you don't have a lot of experience doing it. I learned over thirty years of doing it the hard way. <laughs> right, making a mess. <laughs> Um, another Bill, question another question yeah this one's actually mine from san diego here with the tragedy of notre dame burning can you hazard mm. a guess as to how much preservation of the traditional sound of the space might be possible when they have to rebuild using modern materials um yeah i, I from what i know uh the organ was uh was saved um and it was just the roof area that was burned. And so um, uh, I can't speak for the architects or the modern curators of that space, whether they wanted to change it or keep the original. I don't know. My guess would, would be that the world, whoever's invested into that and that lovely place would want to keep as much of the original as possible. You know, it, it, it goes back to uh, it's a thousand years old that that place. I mean, there's music that was written for it uh, just before 1200. Uh, Leonin and Peretin, uh, there are this, uh, the Magnus Liber Organi, it's called. There's this great book of, of organum and the, the polyphonic music of that time was written for that space. And uh, there are just so many sacred cows there. Um, but it, there's a lot of stone, right? So, you know, the wood's going to burn, the rafters are going to burn. Those went quickly. But yeah, I don't know what they tried to preserve then. I don't. I the, hope I answered that. The stone, the stone just went black. It went black. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did. I was actually interested in. You know, I'm sure there was a conversation about whether to improve or whether to preserve. And I'm just interested. Mm-hmm. Which direction would you push them? Were you to consult on something like that? Well, I have an early music bias, so I would preserve it. <laughs> Makes sense. Thanks. <laughs> But I love modern architecture too, you know. I live in the modern world. So, so Bill, we've got a great question uh, about uh, moisture. So Roscoe Jones of Madison, Indiana is that there. Does the ambient moisture affect the sound in a wooden space? Can the weather basically affect the sound of a space? Big time. 
Um, so particularly if you play string instruments, because I work with string players as well. Now, modern string players, they have uh, steel wound strings they play. Uh, their E string, the top string is just, you know, a really thin piece of steel there. And uh, uh, the lower strings, sometimes you have a, a gut or synthetic gut material. Like it used to be sheep or cat gut uh, back in the day. And uh, if you are playing on non-compromised historic strings, which we tend to do because we want to create the sounds as close as possible uh, based on what we know to get to the original sound that also uh, helps with the texture uh, of the music to give clarity. Well, the moisture in the air is going to affect that greatly. And uh, you can go flat or sharp if you're in a really hot uh, environment, then your instrument, your brass instrument there is going to, you know, if the air is hot inside, you know, I mean, when we blow into it, it also is, is warm as well. But after we sort of normalize that, that column of air with our regular breath, it's fine. But the string instruments are greatly effective. So are the organ pipes as well. So any string instrument, they'll have to tune constantly, tune constantly mm. for that. Uh, I had a uh, had an experience, and I wonder if if um, you would confirm whether this is right or not. And that is that uh, in a large cathedral here in Adelaide, in South Australia, uh, mm -hmm. large cathedral, probably a thousand seats, uh, twelve hundred seats, something like that, um, long and narrow, like they all are. Um, but it was. Uh, I had a, a PA system we needed for this um, vocal group, and so that's always a challenge, right? When you're trying to work with the sound, but also trying to what kind of vocal group little. was it? Was it a modern uh, so, vocal group? Yeah, uh, it was more of more, more like a, a a jazz sort mm -hmm. of a jazz, jazz ensemble. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and and but a, more of an acoustic sound, and so they have. I say an acoustic sound versus some of the acapella groups that are a bit more of a poppy sound now and a, and mm -hmm. and a more processed sound. Um, anyway, the the point was that we're we're in a very uh, um, not humid, hot, hot environment, and so the 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 cathedral itself is actually quite cool with inside, mm -hmm. um, but it was towards the end of the day, and there was pockets of um, moisture and different temperature within mm. within the space. And what I found, I, I mix on an iPad, so I'm able to walk around everywhere. Right. As I walked through these different pockets of temperature and moisture, I the pitch was changing for me. Um, a, 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 like it was, it was com like sounding different as I was mm -hmm. stepping through these different pockets. Is, it, it was... Was that because I was smoking something, or is that you, is that uh, an actual? Thing? That's possible. That's possible. <laughs> that yeah, you could have been smoking something. No. Uh, so <laughs> you were saying that you were hearing the sound of the singers change yeah. as you walked around. Did yes, I, I'm some totally kind of Doppler Doppler effect or something on your yeah. ears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know so enough of the physics of that to know, but I have experienced if I walk around in a space, it, there's something off or different, but I, I've never really mm. thought to analyze it that way in terms of pitch or frequency. Um, mm. And I, I, now you've given me something to think about. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, it would, it'd be fun to explore because it, yeah. because it was such a big space. Yeah. There's almost this different weather system within it, you know, it's like a, <laughs> as you walk through this different space. Mm -hmm. um, we've got another couple of questions and then perhaps you can, um, if you've got, we'll get to back share. to, um, yeah, I, I would love to play. There are two things I want to play, yeah. uh, before I get to the Let's next question, I just want to make sure before the end of the hour is, uh, Correct. that, that large mic array. So you can hear how you can hear, uh, whatever this recording provides for everyone through the zoom that the panning effect, uh, uh from the different choirs. Uh, that are spaced out. And we also had a virtual project that we did for people uh, from three continents. Um, during the pandemic, when the pandemic hit, I said, I've got to play something. And so we brought in our individual tracks with a, with a click and uh, all of that, and then made and then uh, put ourselves in San Marco, since we, a lot of us have never performed in that space. So, uh, so I want to make sure we, you, you get a chance to hear that. So the yeah, next question is, go ahead. Oh, um, 
Yeah, okay. Bill, have we got the next question? Yeah. yeah, the next one comes from Dave Kaufman in Vancouver, British Columbia. How do you balance direct and reverberant sound fields in these spaces? Oh, if I have a combination of those two, meaning? Uh, well, I guess it, it's like what you were saying before about you were, you were slowing down temp, tempo mm -hmm. is one thing that you would do to manage that, right? So that you can get more of a direct sound. You're hearing, you're hearing the the instruments starting and stopping and hearing that, mm -hmm. that it, would that be one thing that to manage the reverberant sound fields in the space? So I'm balancing, let's see, the direct and reverberant. I, I'm assuming by direct they mean uh, the sound that is just not banking against the wall, right? That's just right. coming straight to me. That probably would be the people who are right in front of me. So that would be the continual grip, like the organ. If those organ pipes are close, sometimes the console will be next to me and then the pipes are at the other end of the church if it's mm -hmm. all uh you know so so that's one thing to consider but for direct would probably be some uh maybe a strummed instrument or a plucked instrument like the like the theorbo which is like a long neck lute that's the crudest way to say that um you know, just you have, it's basically you've got the lute as a guitar like instrument. Uh, early music folks would not call it that, but uh, but then they got the long bass strings that are that are like sort of looks like a lute uh, from uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Heart Club Band in a psychedelic <laughs> situation or something. Um, but uh, it's that's there right in front of me, so I have the continual group provide the. The, the bass, and that's the direct sound that I hear. There is some banking that's happening uh, throughout the church, but but in front of me as the conductor, I'm not really hearing much of that. And then the further the people get away, the more I'm the more reverberant I I hear the sound, particularly of the the sackbuts, the trombones. They will shoot their sound across the room over into uh, another stone space at the other end of the church. So the farther away, I think, the more reverberant it is. Yeah. At least I believe so. Well, so. Let, let's get to more that you, you want to share. I would lo love to hear some of these recordings. It'd be great. Sure. We'll, so this we'll is um, the, uh, the composer Heinrich Schutz, who was the, one of the star students, a German student of um, uh, Giovanni Gabrielli, who was the big figure in San Marco in Venice from the turn of the 17th century. And in 1619, he wrote uh, this large publication called uh, Psalmen Davids, which is the Psalms of David, settings of Psalms. And he had uh, any number of choirs between uh, one and four, and actually six in one occasion. I could be mistaken. But uh, oh, there were a lot of polychoral things that have a four choirs. And then there's information in the preface of it that he wrote on how to perform that, uh, including arrays. And, uh, and uh, you know, they weren't thinking of microphones at the time. So if they did have a, a circle, a surround sound, then it could work. It would, the sound would just go straight up. And that we're talking about the Dresden um, Cathedral. There, there actually, there was a Protestant and a Catholic church in Dresden at the time. You know, we, we know we all lost that in World War II, they rebuilt. But uh, um, anyway, uh, if you remember seeing that uh, array that Marty put up, we have four choirs around me. It looked like actually just four little dashes, two up here and two down here, but they're actually, if you can imagine, they're all in a circle combined. The end of one of the groups starts the beginning of the next and going all around in a circle. And this is the one with the Death Star, I was telling me, the, uh, the, uh, the mic array, sphere array there and uh then the each of the choirs were recorded so you can hear the favoriti which is the soloists and then we go back to the tutti which is all four groups together and uh see what you can uh, uh have a listen to it at least uh, there's some still images to make it in interesting in there so marty could you cue that up from the beginning <laughs>
Okay. Oh, that should be enough there. I don't know how much came through, but in terms of you can hear the lobbying between one choir and the other, and sometimes it's it's one half of the circle and the other half of the circle. What he does is uh, maybe there's a Fibonacci in there. Um, he makes these patterns. It's it's these two, then these two, and then this mm-hmm. one and this one together, and this one this this one together. It's like this musical architecture that's going, and it's this beautiful kind of uh, Renaissancey. Um, I don't know, mathematical uh, uh, perfection there that's inherent in the music, you know, that extended all the way through Bach, you know, so. And so with, within those choirs, there's, there's parts as well, right? Like as in there was, mm-hmm. there was multiple parts that they're singing and there's male mm-hmm. and female voices within each one of those choirs. Mm-hmm. Um, and almost that call and response that was almost, that was happening a little bit in a single voice and then a, a whole choir and yeah I could definitely hear that in the in the stereo uh, space as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we, there's a word for it, a modern word for it, is antiphonal, uh, antiphonal style of writing. But I call it polychoral because a, 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 antiphon mm-hmm. is another religious term uh, has to do with chant, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, the uh, the polychoral style, multiple choirs. It's probably one of the hardest things to record, I would assume. Mm-hmm. I mean, it has been for us. So it, I've been, you know, do, at this for thirty years, and it's never been easy. <laughs> and <laughs> to, to figure out how to plan you, it, you know. Have you been playing around at all with uh, with spatial audio at all, like like moving beyond just just uh, stereo, mixing down to stereo, but but going into uh, full surround. Um, I think the, the the virtual project we sort of toyed and uh, went in that direction. One of my musicians is a uh, is an amateur, uh, brilliant um, sound engineer, and he's also an IT guy who who performs music. And he did a little bit of that, uh, so you can hear not just in the two dimensions, but it it, it feels like three dimensions at times. Because if you imagine somebody's up in a pulpit and you've got a group of four musicians uh in the let's see if your head is facing forward and you're thinking like northeast of your ear or something like that up in a balcony Mm. i think that's what he created Uh, but uh we can hear that maybe toward the end Uh, well i'll take a couple more questions if anybody has because i don't know how many you have yeah we've got a few more there yeah bill (laughs) marty atias from maryland usa here in the panel can we find early music influences in modern music oh yeah Lots of examples of that, um, because it really be- comes down to the mind of the composer. The composer says, well, uh, you know, what is their daily diet of music listening? Nobody writes music in a vacuum. They're always usually influenced by something, and they can be influenced, uh, say, if a jazz musician uh, is directly influenced by Ornette Coleman or John Coltrane or, you know, Bird or whatever, uh, then they might play their saxophone that way. Um, if uh, if a church musician has a daily diet of performing a lot of early music, they might incorporate that into their music in a certain way, creating uh, uh, spatial elements, for example. Igor Stravinsky, who died in 71 or 72, I forget which year, uh, he uh, wrote a piece in the late 50s called the Canticum Sacrum, and he had heard of uh, an ensemble of modern players and voices putting together some uh, Gabrielli in the San Marco in Venice, because he died in Venice, Stravinsky, the Russian composer. And uh, they were just starting to um, explore that uh, early music uh, in in uh, the, uh, the brass circles, because he wrote great brass music. And they were making modern editions of it. And they said, well, let's incorporate that into my very abstract uh, sonic realm that he was doing. Canticum Sacrum is a great piece. Uh, so it's a reference you want to do. But yeah, I, I would say, Marty, that uh, lots of influences. I know when I write, I'm influenced. But there comes the bias there. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Uh, Dave Troutman of Edmonton, Canada. Uh, I've seen choir balconies in the back of some spaces, the less ancient ones. Was this an innovation or just a variance of design to elevate the sound? 
Yeah, they're supposed to be uh, the chancel. Is, they're supposed to be like angels singing in heaven. And that's, that's the, uh, the metaphor that uh, in the design they were trying to, to do that. But not all uh, chancels are up high. Some are down near the altar. Uh, it depends on the architect. And it also depends on which sect of religion it is, whether it's Protestant or Catholic. Um, but uh, in general... Yes, um, that was a, it could be a variance, I guess. So you've seen the choir balconies in less ancient ones. Yeah, I think more common is the ones where the, the, the chancel is higher. They sing from the balcony up there. And I like that you can misbehave up there without people, you know, if you're waiting for your next uh, anthem, you can do whatever you want until that that happens. <laughs> no one's watching you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Next question. Roscoe Jones, Madison, Indiana. Please describe the difference for each brass ensemble member of playing in different spaces. Are some preferred by the trumpets and others by the tubas? Or is it the blend that matters the most? I think mostly blend, but each of those instruments have a distinct sound. Um, going from the cornetto, um, I would like for Marty, actually, if you can show me uh, the, the image of these early brass instruments, the cornetto and the sackbutt there, first with the painting and then, uh, then the engraving by Pretorius should be in there somewhere. And I want to show that because you will see that the bore size and the taper of the instrument will determine how far it travels. Uh, whether the, the sound cones out, right, or whether it is already round to begin with and just sort of wafts up in the air. Um, uh, yeah, so is everybody seeing that? Up on the top left in this drawing, this was uh, from uh, 1617, a drawing by Michael Pretorius in his treatise Syntagma Musicum. Uh, that is the cornetto. And so cornetto means horn, you know, like an animal horn or something. And uh, a lot of them were made from ivory, but also some were carved wood wrapped in leather and bored out. You can, you can just carve out the wood and, and it's played like a brass instrument, buzzed um, uh, uh, on the side of your lips and then uh, fingered like a, like a woodwind instrument. And the reason I mention all that is because this is a this is a very tight cone. If it cones right here, you don't hear a lot of sound right where you are, but it pierces through the whole space and gets louder as you go as you go out. So when you have uh, uh, conical instruments like that, they can create a different effect from, say, a straight instrument like the trumpet or the sackbut. The sackbut was actually born from the trumpet, and it's a straight instrument. You can see the ones, on, the three sizes on the right in the drawing. Um, they, uh, the board does not flare out anywhere until the tail end where the bell happens. So that determines if you're going to get an immediate loud sound right where you are or not. But what's interesting is these instruments in a large cathedral, they still just sort of well up and they can fill the space uh, with a nice echo together, but they all have their own distinct sounds uh, based on their bore size with that. Oh, wow. And the tuba, the, tuba, the tubers are the extreme example of that. Those are the ones that are the most round, very large internal volume and conical hmm. so and, and would that would that um when that when that happens i guess the i guess my question is is that it's uh, when it's pushing that that sound out further mm -hmm. and not as loud there does it create more energy that that is bouncing around so is is it is it uh like if it's loud at the source mm -hmm. will that dissipate the energy faster than if it's more projected um, I only know from anecdotal experience there, uh, the more focused the sound, the more clearly I can hear it banking off of the wall. Um, and the tuba might just sort of dissipate and just, I guess, uh, eventually die away the sound. Right. Um, I, I think that the cornetto uh, or the trumpet, um, the, the smaller instrument, which is a uh, straight and not conical is going to, um, is, is going to really pierce 
through things. And I, I should say, there's a, a nice historical uh, reference uh, by Marin Marcin, Mersenne, who was a French musician. He wrote a treatise about these instruments, 1636, I believe the year was. And he said that the sound of the cornetto, now we know how to play it just by the way it's described in a treatise, uh, the, the sound that we should create, is the sound is akin to uh, a beam of light piercing through the window of a cathedral. If you, if you think of a stained glass, mm -hmm. something going through, it just pierces through. So yeah. the more focused it is, the more it's the, the, the more long lasting that uh, sonic wave is going to go. Um, but uh, uh, that's only anecdote. I'm not speaking from mm -hmm. being a physicist or no physicist. Yeah. Not physician physicist. I, I, I don't know exactly but i think i'm on the right track maybe fair enough did now um did you have another thing to play at all or was, uh how much time you, do we have uh well we've got a few more minutes there okay maybe a couple of quick questions maybe but well maybe we can get in that there. example so we can hear the uh yeah. the uh um uh, the 3d or I, I guess I would call it 4D, <laughs> 4D array of sound. Virtual. Here. We'll see mm -hmm. what comes out. And I, I hope there's no compression from YouTube and we'll see. I mean, there is going to be some compression, but to what degree, I don't know. So this is, a, I'll just, before you play it, Marty, um, the, I'll, I'll describe what this, is, what this is. It's a Sonata number 20, uh, 22 for 22 different players uh, and divided into five choirs of players and an organ together with the central one. So we'll start with that and you'll see the distinct different groups of instruments there. And there's one string group. And then there's one group that has a double reed in it, which is an early bassoon. And uh, they all play their little feature and then they all come together at one point. And that's where you see the image of San Marco. And we tried to create a, a three-dimensional sound with this. Um, uh, what else would I say about it? Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's that's good enough. And I can't, I cannot re uh, forget to credit the uh, engineer for the project. His name is Barry Bocanner. Uh, he's the IT guy, brilliant person who plays about twenty-five different instruments. He's amazing. He he's the one who's on the organ there, 
who he had installed the organ in his house for that recording. This was during the pandemic in, uh, I think, September of 2020, where we were all mm. longing to be together to perform some way. People were trying to do it uh, at, uh, simultaneously through, well, Zoom obviously doesn't work <laughs> for simultaneous right. music performance, but there are other, uh, other programs and apps that people were using. And uh, we just yeah. did uh, the individual tracks sent in, and then we uh, edited and mixed them. And there were some wonderful projects that were made during that time, absolutely, uh, like this. And it and it, that sounded absolutely. beautiful, and and definitely mm -hmm. could hear, um, you mm -hmm. know, a bit more than what than just a, a simple stereo image. There was a bit more going on there, which was great. Mm -hmm. um, very good. Uh, I think we've ran out of time. But um, but it, it, it's amazing how easy it is to um to, <laughs> to wax on about this stuff. It's been been brilliant, and we've had lots of people that have been interested. Um, thank you so much for coming, Michael. Um, really appreciate a great um, joy. Thank a look you. Into this. Yeah, it's been it's been okay. really really good. Thank you. Uh, and so thank you to the panelists and, and all the people that have worked uh, on behind the scenes that make all this happen every single day. Tomorrow we're going to be talking about uh, sensors, camera sensors, and uh, the next day we'll have OWC and uh, we'll be talking about some new improvements that they've got so you can bring along your questions. On the weekend we do Saturday, we're just going to have a, a general discussion and Sunday we... Um, get a little bit more introspective and we start talking about some things um, in a deeper level. So you're welcome to come and join us then. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. I mean, uh, the tracks for that is really interesting. You know, for that the one you just played, because we could do a lot of experimentation. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's what he did, but it'd be, I'd, I'd love to talk to him more about the what he uh yeah you know, how spatial he got and whether we could continue to experiment with that it's very i'm rare. still here I, I don't know if you <laughs> no no i'm saying you're you're the person you're the engineer that you're yeah. working with I oh mean, i'd yeah, love yeah. to talk to you about that i mean i'm sorry yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm connect you to him to you. <laughs> I'll, I'll connect I, to, connect yeah, you to him for sure yeah, yeah no because i i um uh i it's very rare to get all the instruments separate you know, and so mm -hmm. our ability to move them around and get them into a spatial space. And I mm -hmm. might have someone that could play with that that has an incredible amount of experience um, in uh, mixing in, in spatial. Uh, I'd love to see if we can get, if I can get them interested. <laughs> so let, let, <laughs> yeah, let's, Marty, if you can put us together, I, I don't know if I, 